Hi everybody, it's Jerry, and welcome to the Military Collectible Shop. This is a series that we do called Military Collecting 101, where we try to uh, share our knowledge with, I usually say younger collectors, but we're changing that to newer collectors, as we've realized that there's a lot of newer collectors that are joining the hobby that aren't necessarily younger. Uh, so we welcome everybody. So Military Collecting 101 is our attempt to share some of the knowledge that we've picked up along the way to help you avoid some of the pitfalls and some of the information that has kind of been ingrained in us but might not be uh, readily apparent to the new collector. So today I'm going to be talking about German helmets. Now German helmets are one of the most iconic of all military headgear. The silhouette alone um, is enough. You know, it, it's got all kinds of connotations of, uh, you know, evil and darkness and, uh, you know, menacingness, all that. Um, and so, it, as we see in the movie Star Wars, uh, you know, the good guys weren't wearing helmets like that. Um, but I wanted to kind of go over a little bit of the, the evolution of the German helmet and some of the various forms that, that it takes, that they take. Um, now, for those of you who are advanced collectors or, uh, you know, experienced collectors, feel free to turn this off now um, because I'm going to be covering a lot of basic information um, that might honestly bore you to tears. Uh, but if you want to hang along for the ride, um, and if nothing else, snicker at all the things I get wrong, that's fine. You're welcome to do that. Uh, I'm going to be sharing several examples from both our store stock and of my own collection. Um, so I'm going to be covering uh, some of the, starting with World War One, um, arguably pre World War One, uh, and then into World War One, and then into World War Two. Uh, I won't be covering any of the the later helmets uh, post World War Two. So um, let's get started. Some of the more iconic images that we have of German helmets are the Germans wearing their spiked helmets, or Pickelhauben. Haube? Haubin? Haubin is the plural. Anyways, Paul's banging his head on his computer right now. Um, but the German spiked helmet. And the interesting thing, there's, there's several theories as to how that got designed. Um, you know, basically somebody's brother, cousin in the aristocracy went to go visit his other cousin in Russia. They saw these helmets there. They thought they looked imposing. They wanted their guys to wear them. At some point, even the U.S. Army was wearing uh, spiked helmets in the 1880s as part of the military fashion. So uh, the German helmets started out as basically a, a leather helmet uh, with brass fittings. This one's missing a few pieces, missing the, the iconic spike. But just to give you an example, and it's, it's actually, I believe, a police helmet. Um, just to give you an idea of the, the brass, the sense of the brass fittings that were used. As World War I came into play, um, the Germans actually were still wearing these helmets. Um, and so they had the, uh, the, the, brass, the brass fittings. Now this one happens to be what's known as an er ersatz. Uh, it's made out of felt. There was actually a leather shortage, um, so they uh, they were trying other things. Now, the Germans soon realized that wearing a, a bright, shiny helmet into combat wasn't probably a good good thing to do. So, in, for combat, they actually came up with cloth covers. And then, uh, during the wartime, about 1916, I believe, 15, 16, um, they started going with what we call the wartime gray, kind of subdued paint. Now the interesting thing about the German spiked helmets is that, you know, still at this time, Germany was still coming off of being a series of different states and, and duchies and, and different kind of groups, um, you know, mainly dominated by Prussia and uh, Bavaria in, in these two cases. But you'll see a lot of different uh, front plates used by a lot of different troops. Um, and you'll also see different colored uh, cockades that were used on the sides. If I was starting collecting over again, I'd actually collect the German spike helmets. There's such a variety of them. You've got enlisted mans, uh, 
helmets, you've got officer's helmets. Generally they had different fittings, enlisted man's uh, had a leather chin strap, officer's used a chin scale type of chin strap. Um, so you, and just a wide range of helmet plates and different emblems from all the different states. And then there's actually different style of, of helmets too. As you know, back in the 1870s, they were a lot higher, different shaped. Um, then they kind of calmed down a little bit to what we see now. Okay, obviously with all kinds of stuff blowing up in the trenches on you during World War I, the thought of wearing a leather or even a felt helmet, you know, didn't provide a whole lot of protection for you. So the Germans came up with what is kind of the uh, the model um, 1916 uh, steel helmet. So a couple of interesting things about the, the 1916 steel helmet. Um, sometimes referred to as the coal scuttle because it sort of looked like the things that they used to keep coal in uh, back in the day. But you'll notice these two lugs up on the top. These actually serve a couple different purposes. These are, these are vent holes, so some of the hot air that's you know, in, in your hat can actually escape. Um, and there was what was known as a machine gunner's plate that was able to mount on the front as you would poke your head out of the trenches. Obviously this is the first part that would come out. So it afforded a little bit more protection um, for those guys who were you know, peering out. Um, and in order for these plates to be able to mount on all the different helmets, because Germans, in their typical Germanness, had uh, several different sizes of helmets, uh, depending on the size of your head. Um, so the lugs actually had to be always in the same place. So that's a quick way of kind of determining size of a helmet, is looking at the lugs. And if they're built up by spacers, then you know it's a smaller helmet. If there's no spacers, it's a larger helmet. Um, now this one is actually really cool because it's actually a camouflaged uh, Model 16. And the, the other thing that tells us that it's a Model 16, because the Germans did come out with a Model 18 in 1918, uh, but what we see on the Model 16 helmets is that they're using a really similar chin style retention method as they did on the, uh, on the, on the spiked helmets which unfortunately was a horrible way of attaching a chin strap because they can easily fall off. They just need, you just need to align the slot you know, with the post and it'll, it'll pop right off. This one, because it's bent. Um, okay, so what they did on the Model 18 generally kept kind of the same, the same shape but had an improved liner with, an, with a more uh, integral um, chin strap holder in the liner band. Typically these had a three pad kind of pillowy liner. Um, again kind of a neat one with the camouflage paint. Okay so that was a quick run through from the 18, 1850s all the way through uh, the end of World War I. Okay, so after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Germany was only allowed to keep a very small army. So you'll see, um, you know, the, the 1918 helmets were still uh, being used, the 1916 uh, helmets were actually still being used, but in very limited numbers. Um, and what we eventually see is that as uh, Hitler and, and the National Socialists take power, um, in 1933, that the army adopts uh, the National Eagle as part of their uh, emblems. So, uh, on this particular helmet, uh, which is a model uh, 1918, uh, we see the national, the German National Eagle, as well as the the national tricolors, black, white, and red of Germany. So this is what's known as a double decal. This is actually what's also known as a transitional helmet, because it's 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 basically it's a World War One helmet that's transitioning, uh, you know, into into World War Two. Um, now, one thing that I failed to mention on the first part of World about the World War One helmets is that you'll usually find a size and a maker stamp uh, inside the skirt of the helmet. Um, unfortunately, as I say that, this one seems to either be obliterated 
far stamp so lightly I can't find it. But I'll show you that uh, on, on another example. Uh, but this is a nice double decal transitional German army helmet. Then, in 1935, you know, so a scant, this, this one came about in 1933, so it was worn for about two years, because in 1935, they came out with the model, say it with me, M35 um, German helmet, where it's, it's obviously, it's a little more streamlined design. Um, instead of the big lugs, it still has the vent holes, but it incorporates smaller vent holes. And this one is actually still a double decal, you know, with the national emblem, national emblem uh, in the tricolor and the, the eagle emblem of the army. So one of the other things that, um, because the German helmets will retain this, this silhouette basically until the end of the war, but one way to differentiate an M35 helmet from an M40 helmet is the vent holes. So on an M35, these vent rivets are actually separately applied. So you can kind of look inside, if you can get inside the lining, um, or even from the outside, you, you can see a, a decided rim around there. On the M40s, which I'll be showing you in a moment, those are actually um, stamped in. So this was an extra step that they did. And this is actually what they call a rolled edge as well. Uh, to give the helmet some strength and ballistic uh, qualities, they rolled the edge on, on some machining. So a decent example of uh, an M1935 Army helmet. I also have an M35 Luftwaffe helmet. Um, now I wasn't able to get at, I've, I've actually got another one that's earlier that has what's known as the droop tail Luftwaffe Eagle. This one actually has a different Eagle emblem. This is the more standard German Eagle. I believe this one was adopted in around 1938. But again, a double decal. And the, the double decals, um, which we'll see, are, are, as far as helmet goes, they're rarer to find for collectors. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, one of the other helmets I wanted to show you that's also an M35 is a Navy helmet, a German Navy helmet. Now, this actually uses the same Eagle emblem as we saw on the German Army M35. But this one, this eagle emblem, is decidedly gold. And if you look closely at it, the, um, the, the way the decal is made is that that gold layer is actually separately applied over. So you can see a little bit of offset in those. A lot of times, people selling helmets will get what's known as a toned army. From being up in attics and, uh, and just subject to heat in the years, sometimes the army eagles, which are normally silver, turn kind of a goldish color. And because navy helmets are rarer, people will try to sell an army helmet that's with a toned decal as a navy helmet. And so, uh, like I said, one of the ways to um, identify that is to actually look closely at the eagle and see if you can see that little bit of offset of, of the, the gold layer of the decal, almost giving it a 3D effect. Okay, so um, now we've transitioned from you know 1933 up through 1935 uh, with the with the 1938 probably with this Luftwaffe Eagle. The earlier ones have shorter, stubbier wings and what, what are sometimes known as a, a snake leg because the the leg holding the swastika looks a little wonky. Um, so okay, so these helmets were all used up until, uh, you know, they came out with the 1940. The other thing I wanted to mention is as Germany invaded Poland in 1939, uh, one of the harder lessons I think they learned pretty fast is that having a bright red and white thing on your helmet, um, probably not the best idea. Um, because that could actually be seen from a ways away. Um, okay, this is why this is why fire engines are red because our eyes are more sensitive to that color. So basically, the Germans were ordered uh, to remove the decals uh, from their helmets. That's why, like on this navy one, even though it's an M35, we don't see the national decal on the other side because by that time 
it was, you know, kind of deemed like, no, this really isn't a good idea to have that there. So you'll start seeing the decals actually be scraped off um, or just removed or painted over. So not uncommon on an M35 helmet to see a decal painted over. I can't state this enough, never, never, never go digging for decals, okay? Just don't do it. The Germans painted their helmets for a reason. Respect that. You don't want to wander into combat with a bright national decal hanging out there, okay? I see collectors do it and it's just horrible. Oh, I wonder if there's a decal there. Yeah, there is. You can see the outline of it. Stop touching it. They literally ruin helmets. It's like the American helmet collectors who go digging for the heat lot number and just rub that paint right off. Stop it. It's a number. You know it's there. Who cares? Not that big of a deal. Don't wreck your helmets. Okay, uh, so that, that takes us through, again, uh, 19... Model 1918 uses a transitional helmet through uh, about 1933 until um, we come out with the 1935s. Um, and then we don't see the, the helmet evolve until uh, again until 1940. So let's take a look at some of the, the Model 1940 helmets. Okay, now in 1940, uh, they started coming out with the M1940 helmet, which was basically a way to uh, help speed up production. So they changed a couple of the different things. The way the liner band um, is actually in there changed a little bit. It wasn't quite so fragile because they had some problems with braking. Um, and most notably, they uh, stamped in the vents rather than having them separately applied. So they still have the rolled edge, you know, giving it that ballistic strength. German helmets are very uh, ballistically solid. So a nice, nice design. Um, you know, also provided, I believe, 11% more coverage uh, to the wearer than the U.S. helmet. So this one's a, a Luftwaffe uh, helmet. Again, single decal, because by this time they'd done away with the double decal. So a single decal. Now, in 1942, we start seeing what's known as the Model 42 German helmet, where Again, a lot of the similarities between the M40 and, uh, and the M42, the stamped vent hole, but now, instead of rolling the rim under, they actually flare it out. So it still gives it a decent amount of stability, but they were able to press these out a lot faster. They didn't have to go through the process of rolling the rim under. Um, so. You know, that, that was a, a manufacturing step to be able to kick out more helmets. Because by 1942, for Germany, you know, the, the writing was a little bit on the wall. They, they were not designed for a, a protracted war. They had thought with the advent of Blitzkrieg and their combined efforts of, you know, using very fast attacks, uh, coordinated with air attacks and, and ground forces, that the war would actually be over. They did not plan on getting into a long, drawn-out conflict. So um, they needed, and they were short resources, so they needed to kick things out and kick them out fast. So that's where they came up with the M42 helmet. Now, that being said, and you also notice another uh, expediency of the M42 is this particular example does not have any decals. They just, in some cases, they stopped issuing decals with them. Um, now, you will see you will see the M42s with single decal Army helmets, you'll see them uh, single decal SS helmets, and single decal Luftwaffe helmets, um, in addition to some of the police, which I'll cover uh, shortly. Okay, uh, there was a company, though, that just, that felt that the stamped rim um, just didn't provide enough protection. So they actually continued making rolled rim helmets uh, through the end of the war, and that was a company known as Quist. Um, and I remember when I told you about the stampings on the uh, inside? Uh, so n normally what you'll see is you'll see the German uh, maker code. This one happens to be a Q for Quist, uh, but you could see uh, ET, NS, uh, several different makers, along with the helmet size, because again, the Germans, being Germans, still made them in several different sizes. Um, and then the liners had to match up to those sizes. Um, and then you'll also see what's known as a heat lot number. So that kind of tells you 
it tell, told them, you know, where the where the steel came from, kind of where it ended up in the process. So if there was a problem ballistically, they could trace it back. Uh, so this is another nice example, uh, probably a Luftwaffe one, given the blue-gray color of a, of a nice German um, M M40 helmet, but probably issued, you know, a little later, later in the war. Um, the, the Q um, always has a little bit bigger vent holes. Some of the collectors sometimes call these the uh, Cheerio um, size vent hole. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the civil helmets that were worn in Germany uh, during World War II. Okay, so probably the most common civil helmet that you're going to encounter uh, from Germany in World War II is what's known as a Luftschutz helmet. The Luftschutz was the uh, literally air protection. So uh, they were the guys kind of like the United States air raid wardens um, who would be responsible for like maintaining blackout conditions and um, you know, working with, working closely with the police and fire departments to put out fires, uh, find unexploded ordnance, um, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. So the interesting thing is that the Luftschutz had a very unique, they call it the gladiator style because it's, it's a really unique uh, helmet. Um, and although a lot of collectors kind of look down at the Luftschutz helmet because it, it is a common helmet, um, I think it's a great design, and these are these are helmets that still can be reasonably priced, and and you know and found reasonably in in good condition uh, for the collectors, and with a really interesting history, um, you know, of, of use. So typically painted blue with the front decal, but sometimes you'll find uh, the Luftschutz. Uh, decals on other helmets. Like in this case, this was a this was actually a helmet um, where they found the steel uh, to not be ballistically um, solid. So they would what they call the, these beaded rim ones, where they would um, just kind of crunch the helmet somehow to make it so that they they knew that it was not a helmet for military use. Um, but again, these were widely used by the Luftschutz and by the police force, um, you know, there. So, and you'll actually find, when, in terms of the Luftschutz helmets, you'll find all different kinds of them. They use a lot of captured helmets. You'll find fresh French helmets with the Luftschutz decal, Czech helmets with the Luftschutz decal. Um, you know, some of the World War I ones, again, utilized by the Luftschutz. Um, you know, it's kind of a... And by the time the bombs were falling, you know, the writing was kind of on the wall, so they needed everything that they could get. So, uh, the Luftschutz helmets are still a great, great bargain um, in terms of the German helmet world. Now, um, I did mention the, the German police, and I, I want to talk a little bit about this one. This is actually, this is an M35 uh, German police helmet. This is actually a combat police helmet. Now you're talking, well, you know, what? What do you mean combat? The Germans actually utilized uh, police units in combat in several different uh, areas. You know, actually, actually in fighting, they actually created an SS, the 4th SS Division, uh, SS Polizei Division, was actually created from uh, police force guys. So uh, you will find the police decals, the double decal, the um, police eagle, and the German uh, National Socialist emblem um, on on these helmets. This one happens to be an M35. But we'll see the police decals also on the civil helmets. So this is another one of those beaded ones that I talked about. And the interesting thing is this one's actually Luftschutz blue, but with the addition of police decals on it. Now they also had something called the fire police, which was also under the um, um, purview, I guess, of, of the police force. Now, this one happens to be a uh, post-war used one where they repainted it, so they took off the decals. But this is an M34 helmet. They designed it in, M30, in 1934, not an M34. Um, and sometimes these are called as the salt and pepper shaker helmets because they have these air vents that resemble salt and pepper shakers. Uh, typically, these are used by the police and by the fire departments and you'll see the fire departments actually utilized a comb 
on the top on their early helmets. A lot of times they were later removed. Um, and then the fire also had a, a removable neck flap to keep burning embers and basically just crap falling down uh, your neck, you know, as you're trying to put out these, these fires. So you'll also see that probably the second most common encountered helmet uh, after the Luftschutz helmet is going to be a German police M34 helmet. Um, now we do happen to have, this is kind of an interesting variant of the M34. Um, and this, this one actually shows the uh, where the comb would be. They have these, these attachment holes for the comb to go on it. And it also, we have the little leather tabs for the neck flap to attach to. So that would come down on the neck. But this one has actually got the national decal and a Luftwaffe decal. So this would have been for a fire unit attached to the Luftwaffe. A lot of times at air bases, they had their own fire units. So um, just kind of, kind of neat to see. And then one more I can show you. This is another police one. Um, interesting thing about this one again, it was Luftschutz blue. Um, might have even had a decal at one point, but then it was repainted gray and utilized by the police, by the by the police force. Um, so not the police like staying in Stuart Copeland. And the other guy. Everybody always forgets the other guy. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so that was a quick um, roundabout way. <laughs> I tried to be organized. Um, but a quick primer on the German helmets. There are tons of variants with every category. There are subcategories, sub branches. Uh, with every rule, there are other ones. Um, a lot of different variables. As the war progressed, we start seeing like camo helmets. Um, one of the things I didn't touch on was the, the Luftwaffe uh, Fallschirmjäger or paratrooper helmet, which was its own unique design. Um, but again, those are for more advanced collectors, um, you know, because they, they get kind of expensive. Now, a lot of times people ask me, oh, I got this helmet. How do I know it's real? And, you know, so the, the first thing I'll do is look at, look at the helmet itself, try to ascertain what the shell is. You know, is this an M40? Is this an M35? Or is this something else? Because you'll, you'll see like the um, Spanish had uh, something called the Model Z that they used, which was a German uh, like helmet. Um, as a matter of fact, let me get a couple reproductions so I can share this uh, with you. Okay, so the last part that I'm going to talk about today uh, is just some of the German reproduction helmets that are out there. And they kind of fall into a couple different categories. So uh, first off, we've got a German helmet that really isn't even a German helmet at all. This is uh, what's known as a Spanish Model Z or Modelo Z helmet, uh, where it kind of looks like an M42 helmet, but it doesn't have that flared out edge like the M42 does. It just has sort of a cut off edge. It's also got kind of a unique paint color. And typically, these will actually have a little thing on the front where the Spanish, actually, Spanish Army actually wore a little eagle emblem in the front. So um, sometimes unscrupulous people grind those off and repaint them. In this case, you can still feel the welds where it was. Um, also, you know, different style lining and different style chin strap. I mean, this, it's a real helmet. It's just not a real German helmet. So you don't want to be paying real German helmet prices for helmets that aren't. Um, then we get the category of, you know, uh, reworked helmets. So in many cases, we can actually find helmets that were, um, where the helmet shell is actually real. You know, so this, this actually was an M35 helmet shell. Um, yeah, I believe this is an M35. Uh, but it was completely uh, sandblasted, reworked. It has a reproduction lining put in it. Uh, it has a reproduction chin strap. Um, and it has reproduction paint. And in this case, a reproduction SS decal. So the nice thing about decals is that there are several known manufacturers of German decals. And 
of, of each style, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, and SS. And you really want your helmet decals to conform to those known pattern examples. There's some great books out there on helmets. If you're interested in helmets, get the books. Uh, there's no one book that's the Bible, but, but by utilizing several of the books and reading through them, looking at the examples of what they show, and then getting out to shows and looking at helmets yourself, looking at the decals. The interesting thing about the German decals is that they were applied actually with lacquer. They weren't like the water-based decals like we see on some of the airplanes, um, you know, where it just slides off and slides on. But on a lot of the reproductions, that's what they used. Basically just water-based decals. So one, they don't hold up so well. Now, this is another collectorism that I want to dispel. Do not, under any circumstances, when you're looking at a helmet, try to scrape at the decal. That's not a, a method of telling if something is real or not. Because in some cases, World War II German helmets, like the Navy helmet that I showed earlier, actually had their decals applied, you know, later on over a base, paint, base layer of paint. So they don't adhere like they do to the, to the early ones. So you don't want to be responsible for flecking off, especially a real decal, okay? I've seen people do it, and it's like, oh my god, don't do it. One, it's not your helmet. You shouldn't be doing that anyways. Two, even if it is your helmet, don't do it. There are other ways to see if that decal is real. Okay, so we've got the non-German helmets, the uh, real helmet shell. Um, actually, this one is a real helmet shell as well. Um, but again, the lining, the liner, the leather is too new. You know, it's actually utilizing leather as a tie. These are what we lovingly refer to as reenactor specials. Um, because they're great for reenactors, living history guys. Um, you know, they can they can paint them up however they want. You're, you're not going to hurt nor help the value of it. It kind of is what it is. Um, and I guess the third category, and I apparently don't have an example of here, um, are the, the German helmets that are newly made. Uh, like everything else, they are reproducing them in China and other places of the world. Um, and some of the ways you can tell uh, is the shells are a lot lighter weight steel. They, they flex. The German, the real German helmet's not going to flex so much. Um, the edge is a big giveaway on a lot of the uh, real versus reproduction ones because the, the beaded edge on a German helmet is going to be really nice and straight. Typical German quality. On the Chinese ones, they warble. You know, they're just, they were kicking them out. Not a, you know, they weren't so concerned with the niceties of it. Um, I've seen, I've seen kids pay a lot of money for helmets that have been repainted. Once a helmet's been repainted, in my opinion, it kind of loses all historical value. It's still a, a decent German helmet, yes, but, you know, once it's, once it's been repainted, unless it was done by the Germans during the time, it's no longer a period helmet and it's not going to be. Um, okay. I think that's as far as I can go um, without getting down too many rabbit holes. Again, there's a lot of different variants of every helmet. For every rule, there's something that breaks it. Um, but collecting German helmets uh, is a very rewarding um, hobby. You know, again, a very iconic uh, piece of history. Something you can hold in your hand. Something you can wear in your head if it actually fits. Um, but definitely a, a story design. Interestingly enough, the U.S. helmet, the uh, the Fritz, as they call it, um, the U, when the U.S. after World War One, the U.S. was looking at a, a how to develop a better protected helmet than the the traditional doughboy one, and they actually looked to the German designs and saw that they provided more protection. Um, they didn't go to it because of the connotation with the Germans. Um, and again, as we went to the Kevlar helmets, there was actually some initial pushback from the Kevlar design because it more closely resembled the German helmet of World War II. So, uh, you know, still a design that, that uh, you know, holds a lot of power and influence, um, but a very iconic design um, and an interesting uh, in, in storied, storied history uh, throughout its entire evolution from the spiked helmet, um, you know, to the, the later helmets that we see toward the end of the war. Um, I do just want to mention, because we've, we've, had, we've actually had one of these. 
At the end end of the war, they came out with an M40, it's known as the M45. Um, it was actually an M42 helmet that didn't have any vent holes. So there's still, it's a little bit of a controversial helmet among collectors, um, but you know, we've had one, they, they do exist. Um, and that was kind of the end of the helmet in Germany until they became, um, you know, then, then you actually start seeing the West Germans, the border guards start using a very similar uh, helmet again um, in uh, after World War II. Okay, so that's all I got today. Uh, thank you for joining me. Feel free to uh, email me your questions, uh, concerns, corrections, um, you know, anything, anything you want to share. We love hearing from you. If there's any topics you actually want us to cover, um, we're more than happy to try to share again what we know uh, with you. You know, I wish it could be more of a, of a discussion, uh, but uh, you know, this way at least you get a smattering, and hopefully this encourages some younger collectors uh, to get in and uh, you know get their feet wet with the the world of German helmet collecting. So until next time, I'm Jerry. We're at the Military Collectible Shop. Thanks for joining me. Class dismissed. <laughs>